All right, what is up, guys? Welcome back to Late Night Shots Podcast, episode 57 today. Um, you probably already know why we're here for in the title of this video. NCAA preseeds or whatever these are called just came out. More than any weight class, 141 in heavyweight or probably the worst. 141, we can run through that really quickly, but then I want to hop into this. 141 has, obviously, Jaden Iron is the one seed, Big Ten champion, defeated um, Nick Lee in the final 6-5. to five. The two seed is uh, Tariq Wilson out of NC State, I think is still undefeated right now. The third seed is yep. Dom Demas out of Oklahoma, who is, I think, still undefeated. The fourth seed is Nick Lee. You all know who he is. And the fifth seed is Sebastian Rivera. Where this becomes a problem, you can you may already be able to tell, but with Jaden Ironman, Nick Lee, and Sebastian Rivera at the top half of the bracket, only one of them will make the finals. Right? Yep. Best case scenario is if Lee gets moved up to three or Lee to two and then Sebastian Rivera to three or Lee to three is, is probably the most reasonable – and see Bass somehow gets booed in sixth. Yeah. But that would cause a quarterfinal match, which it would be anyways, right? I think that's the only really thing you can see about that. Otherwise, it's really whatever. But <sighs> heavyweight. All right, let's hop right into this. So um, one seed in Gable Stevenson, obviously. No doubt about that. Cleared up anybody that was doubting him. Against Mason Paris, you know, clear that it should have real quickly. Um, yeah. Two seed uh, Matt Stencil out of Central Michigan. Great. I'm going to pop on the uh, Yep, we're good. Uh, as far as they have right now, the three seed is Colton Schultz out of Arizona State. The four seed is Gannon Gremmel out of Iowa State. Yeah. Dude, already looking at this, it just seems like, oh. And then the five seed is Mason Paris out of Michigan. The sixth seed is Eastern Schultz Lair. Win, um, the did Pac-12. Schultz win Pac-12? Yep. Sweet. The sixth seed is Ethan Laird out of Ryder. The seventh seed, Big Tony out of Iowa. And the eighth seed, Jordan Wood out of Lehigh. Hopefully it's not too scuffed afterwards. But if you look at that top eight, no Greg Kirkfleet, no Christian Lance, no Tate Orndorff, no Trent Hilger. Those are essentially two All-Americans there, and no Luke Luffman. Yeah. That's all I can say right now. You know, there's obviously guys that are fighting for for wild card bids out anywhere. I think, uh, look at the seedings, I'll tell you what I agree with. I agree with Gable at one, obviously. Yeah. I could agree with Stencil at two. I'm not opposed to that, but I do think as of the time being, it should be Mason Paris. Right. Right, and I think anybody will say that. Either way, all that does is boost Stencil to three. Colin Schultz, I don't want to say he's not deserving of a three seed, but he hasn't had the caliber of wins. And the caliber no. win of win that Gannon Gremmel is getting boosted up to be – Moves him to that three seed, which he's not. Yes. Gannon Grumble is not a four seed. I don't think Gannon Grumble All-Americans, I'll be completely honest with you. that That's just what I've seen from him so far. I've been beyond disimpressed with this against Tony Castiope last season, Colton Schultz this season. Didn't look too great. Right. And that's, that's just what I'll say, right? right? He does have a win over Zach Elam, though. That's yeah. what's boosting him up in there. So does Carter Isley from UNI. Looking at a five seed, Mason Paris. Is there really any doubt that he should be a two seed? The only no. valid debate is uh, Matt Stetzel. They're two and three all the time. Mason won three times by decision. Stetzel won twice by pin. Right. That seems like to be the only even cause for a debate in this argument right now. But, you know, that's what it will be. And then the six seed... This is where it starts to get completely messed up. Ethan Laird from Ryder. Good wrestler. Saw the bone. 
He has a win over Jordan Wood. Wood looked injured, if I say that myself, right? He scored off of Jordan Wood's bad shot, won the duel for Ryder. I don't think he's a succeed. He got handled 8-2 to two by Matt Stencil. Right. Um, Jordan Wood, I'm pretty sure, beat Matt Stencil. That being said, you know, Jordan Wood is uh, the second highest returning placer, and he's an eight seed. That should say a lot. Right. And then, look at Cassiope right now at the seven seed, just sitting there. That said, that sets this. Looking at this bracket, the most obvious prediction you can see is a Cassiope Gable final or a yeah. Stencil Gable final. That's essentially what this yeah. looks like right now. And yep. if we see Paris versus Gable in the semis, you know, Paris would have made the finals against Gable last year. I don't think anybody's denying that. Say if he got past that. That's, that's what just bugs me about like bad seeding. Cause now like we know what the actual best match in the tournament is. And it's not even the finals. Cause even if like, Sure, Cassiope makes it to the finals, but then the question is always going to be – I mean, the fact of it is always going to be if Paris was on the same side of the bracket, wouldn't have made it. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, it just kind of sucks, you know. And that's what is the same like thing here. that happened in the last NCAA tournament. It was seeded yeah. correctly. I'll, I'll be honest with you, though. They can't come at them for seeding. That's how it should have been seeded. Yeah. It was just a rough draw for Gable. He did. Yeah. Cassiope, I've talked about this already. Cassiope was the one seed. I don't think he makes the finals. Yeah. I think Stencil takes him out. Yeah. Right place at the right time. We talked about this already. But even that being said, Hayden Hiley versus Jason Ulf, national finals. The year after, Hayden Hiley versus Jason Ulf, semifinals. I don't want to say controversial call. I keep trying to make this shit interesting for you guys. It's, it's literally so hard at this point. <laughs> it's like it, after he majored Mason Paris, it's like, all right, whatever, you can have it now. It's like, yeah, but you know, I a highly no situation, yeah. Like, I, I'm gonna be honest, I'm a massive, I'm a massive fan of Penn State, and I'm a huge fan of Jason North. Highly, highly scored. That was two, possibly. Like, I don't know, man. I mean, it's tough. And it was nice to see, you know, Jason Nolf make the finals and do his thing against Berger, but, like, shit, man. Highly scored that goddamn takedown. Now, the question was That's becomes what because... essentially lost him the Hodge Trophy, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I was rooting from, for both from day one, but, like, you know, that's, that's yeah. essentially what that is. Yeah. Right now, if you look at it, I was talking to somebody. What if Crickley cuts to 97 next season? I just don't think he can. He's 228 at Big Tens. Yeah, but that's a lot of – on, like, a frame like that, like, yeah, okay, no, a taller dude yeah. cutting weight tends to be – and I'm just going to say this anecdotally, like, from my own experience. Sometimes being a taller dude, just because you can make the weight doesn't mean you should. Last year, um, I'm, I'm six foot, six foot one. It was a darn stat. <laughs> oh, my um, God, dude. That, that dude, dude my is freshman different. freshman year – my freshman year, I was, like, 138 at, like, six six foot. Yeah. Like, so just because I could make 170, my performance was a lot worse. Kirk mm-hmm. Lynn's been a heavyweight for so long, and he kind of loses some of that athletic advantage. Because we are talking about nationals. Let's talk about, hypothetically, he goes 197 and meets A.J. Ferrari next year. What makes A.J. Ferrari so good at 197 is that he is ludicrously fast for the weight. Mm-hmm. Faster than probably any heavyweight. If you if you think about a heavyweight's speed and then a- AJ's speed, right? I'm not saying like Kirk Liet does specific training to get faster. I'm saying if you took Kirk Liet, how fast he is right now in AJ Ferrari. I'm not gonna obviously it's, AJ is about the same. Out of water, but there's a gap. Yeah, there is a gap. And you right? also and have so to think about that. Kirk Liet, Kirk that AJ, advantage no. at Sorry. No, Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. advantage at heavyweight is his frame and his speed. At 197, 
AJ Ferrari is perfectly built for the weight class. He's got the wingspan so that a so that Kirkley's length isn't actually going to be a massive problem in the hand fight, and he's got the perfect style to deal with a longer length gear wrestler, which is avoiding the hand tie, hand, hand fight, right? Because if a longer length gear dude gets leverage on you, he can, he can get, gets his hands on you. Man, I'm scattered. If a longer length gear dude gets his hands on you, he can really pull on your head. AJ Ferrari doesn't need to get into a hand fight. He's got an incredible blast double. Yeah. I don't know how well that getting on your knees and crawling on all four shit works against Kirk Vliet. Probably not does all, but I would hope that I would hope that AJ's got a good enough head on his shoulders that he doesn't try that with like a top. What else, top what dude. else does he have against top level guys? That's He's actually got problem, an yeah. excellent low single, and obviously he is Again. a freakishly strong human being. Yeah, but see, he's frequently strong for 197. He's below average for a top level heavyweight. Oh, for a top. I've seen his. I've seen his numbers. Was yeah. like a, a 350 bench at most, which is I mean, obviously incredible. But he's got a very Kirk Fleet threw very up sports specific in his training. He's oh not yeah, big no. on like squatting to like, like he's not powerlifting anytime soon. You know, mm-hmm. but yeah, like if if we. If we talk about barbell strength comparison to a guy like Braxton Mikesell, which might be unfair because he holds a world record. Yeah, but, no, I'm, I'm talking about Greg Kerfoot. Kerfoot wins, except for deadlift. Yeah, Kerfoot, you yeah. see Kerfoot's wingspan. That's unmatched at heavyweight. Kerfoot's designed to deadlift, man. Yeah. And his deadlift isn't even a good lift, really. It's like a 550, 600. Yeah. His bench I mean, double is, body weight is good. Not, not really for at, the, at that high of a level. I mean, I'm just being completely honest. You want at least you want to push up, try that three range, and you have to realize and, college athletes don't deadlift. Yeah, and people people train their whole lives for like a triple body weight deadlift. I mean, heavyweight guys, yes. I mean, you want to be yeah. pushing up at least like two point. The difference between double body weight and like two point three, two point four is huge, right? Yeah, I mean, shit. Like, if you pulled off a double body weight deadlift, that'd be like. Massive, a lot. pretty much. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's like second place at this point. But like, sorry, that that that's not a dig at you. It's no, like, no, it's all good. Point. I'm I'm just saying. Like for me, like even like when I was like lighter, four or five, it was so easy to get to that point. Yeah, getting past that was the problem. Yeah, you know, if Kirkley it's Frank can bench four hundred and fifty pounds. Kirkley can bench four hundred fifty. Yes. Well. I feel humbled. <laughs> well, he, he's a he's a world class athlete. He's a world class wrestler. He he looks injured. You know, I hate. I don't want to be making excuses for him, but he he was injured. He looked injured. Well, yeah, he, he was. Should, he should How badly was it? Because what? Since like they it looked very shirt. bad. There is no there is no excuse for you to lose Tony Cassiope. Tony Cassiope do, lost to Yusuf Amida. Breaker for Yusuf Amida. I trust Kale's judgment in that. He he said he would not pull. Um, he said that he will would not put Kirkley in if he did not think that he could perform to his expectations. I don't know if what he said specifically was if he can win nationals. I'm pretty sure it was just if he can perform to expectations. His expectation should have been at least a third place. Yeah, you know, getting majored by anybody in the country should not happen to a guy that yeah. good. And, yeah. You know, no knock him like Cassiope's good, but. Can't give up that ride time. Like, he looks like – when I talked to him, he said he was, like, 240, 245. People were telling me he weighed in at 228. Multiple people. Probably lost weight because of the recovery from whatever yeah. the injury was. Torn ACL. Yeah. Oh, torn oh, – fuck. <sighs> I mean, Mason Paris beating – Mason Paris blew through him. Mason Paris is slower than him, and he has a worse build to wrestle him. There's no – the only reason he lost because he got ridden and he got blown through on his shot. Where he, and if you saw that, he didn't defend it. He got damn gave, gator roll. He just man. gave up the two. I you wish know, he never like, went for that gator roll. That, that's irrelevant. What does that make it um, a 10-2 to two match? A 9-2 to two match? Still, like, well, so because, like, what I think about my thought process whenever, like, you play around with the what-ifs of a match – Every single scoring exchange changes something, right? People talk about how wrestling is a mental game. I've had, like, I've had a lot of matches where, like, and this is where, like, other stuff comes into play, but there's matches where, like, sometimes a dude 
gets scored on, and then that's what, like, gets him going, which is generally a sign of, like, a poor warm-up. Or, like, scoring exchanges kind of change how you wrestle for the rest of the match. Like, that's why I think, like, I if I remember right, Hydley didn't score that controversial takedown right at the end of the match. If he scored, there still would have been time for Nolf. I can't remember correctly. It might have been a buzzer beater. I could be thinking about other matches. But so if I think about that, I still would have picked Jason Nolf to ultimately pull it off just because Jason Nolf is Jason Nolf, mm-hmm. right? Um, so whenever I think about that match and I say that I wish he didn't get a roll, if he didn't do that, because I think what happened was he got scored on and he got rattled. A dude that good probably isn't getting scored on super frequently in the practice room. Now, you should get scored on in practice. That's just my personal belief. You should always practice with people who can beat you. Or uh, that's as not always. You exhaust yourself. But... Yeah, it's not always yeah, no. possible. Like, my personal training situation, I just have to exhaust myself to the point where, like, there's something there. Damn, you're already but... shitting on your trading partners, too. It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this, Ragam, and I know that you might be listening to this, you're a determined kid. Keep it up. Um, but you're you're a good kid. But um, no, yeah, you know the like I don't know. So I think he got he got scored on and he got rattled. And especially whenever you try something like Gator Roll, that I've literally been in that exact situation. It messes you up for the rest mm-hmm. of the match. Yeah. Now, obviously, my mental fortitude is not even comparable to Kirk Bits, but I feel like <laughs> if he just kept it a little bit more low key, didn't go for like a big move like that, then maybe yeah. he could have stayed on the feet and kept it a little bit. Because, be again, your, his problem was he got ridden out. Mm-hmm. I think it's not controversial to say that Kirk Vitt's kind of a freestyle dude, right? That's yeah, 100%. better style. He's better neutral. In freestyle, right? I think everything would play to his advantage. That played to his disadvantage. You know how hard it would be to gut wrench or likely to die with the frame of Kirk Vitt? I hate gut wrenching people in general. And I'm it. pretty damn sure. Kirkfield's gut wrench is amazing for a guy that I did small. see. I I think U 23s uh he did get Wood. attacked off of a trap arm. Kirkfield, but yeah, some Russian dude in the semis. But oh, uh, the Russians are the best in the world at the gut wrench. And also, yeah, so Kirk that was Sajulai's backup dude. I'm pretty sure. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it may been. have been. That was that. I mean, probably one of them. No, that was at that was at 110 kilos. Yeah. Oh, really? That's his backup. I'm assuming there there's a good amount of people in Russia that could be Olympians at 97. That's fair. That's what you have to realize. Yeah. So you know, and if we go by that, like what Gable got pinned in his junior world finals, like. You know, Mason Paris. Gut wrench. Mason Paris is the perfect guy to wrestle on the international level with his attack rate, mm-hmm. but it yeah. will kill him in the U.S. Yeah. So, speaking of uh, Kirk Vitt's gut wrench, I actually um, I've been working a lot on my freestyle stuff mm-hmm. as of late, and I'm I'm going somewhere with this, and it's going to come back to Kirk Vitt, um, it. which kind of a dumb decision. I got folk style in like two weeks, but. Uh, I was working on gut wrenches with uh, Coach Jay LaValle, and I always hated my gut wrench. Uh, I hate drilling them. I hate doing them. I hate the position as a whole on both ends of it because I suck at it, right? But he he made a point that, like, actually, people with longer arms, so, you know, me, Kirk Vliet, who are both lankier people for their weight classes, it's excellent for your gut wrench because your longer arms means that you can get a tighter lock. So as opposed to, like, a shorter arm person who can maybe get a gable, um, if you're longer armed, you can get elbow to elbow. So, yeah, so that's why Kirk Vliet is probably going to really outperform in freestyle just based on that, like his neutral strength and his ability to gut wrench people. Yeah. Yeah, no, 100%. I think the push out rule, too, is going to play a huge factor. That's yeah. why I've said it time and time again Adam Kuhn, Nick Wazdowski, Gable Stevenson, Mason Paris, not Mason Paris. But those three will be Kyle Snare in a freestyle match. Listen to my reasoning behind this. Okay, Nick, I want to Nick was da- Nick Wazdowski is a whole ass world team member, right? Yep. Why did Nick was da- when did Nick Wazdowski lose that match? About seven minutes and thirty seconds in. Yep. How many minutes are there in a freestyle match? Six minutes. When has Six, that when it. has that extra <laughs> minute in a folk style match ever worked against Kyle Snyder? 
Never. You're saying it, it takes him a little bit longer to get his scores going? No, I'm just saying his conditioning is obviously going to help him. Right. And a lot of his scoring exchanges to win matches are late in the match. Right. Close matches, right? Right. Gable, He's not particularly suited for, like, massive comebacks. Yeah. And you saw that against Adam Kim the one time he lost. Couldn't get anything yeah. going at the end of the match because he got taken down. He got taken down early. Kyvin Getson yeah. got pinned early. Yeah. Jaden Cox snuck in one takedown and run him out. Yeah. That's the exact thing. You know, push out rules are going to absolutely kill him hmm. against Adam Kim. Let's be honest now. Yeah. Adam Kim gets underhook and drives, you're, you're going out of bounds. You know, yeah. no, nah, I I don't want to beat this guy. People hate it when I say this, but Adam Kuhn is literally a bigger, faster, and stronger Cal Snyder. That's what he is. He's, he's faster. I'm, I'm sorry if you don't want to admit it, but he's faster. And it's really not that close. I'm not seeing The main the thing he's in, it's, it's not close. I'll be honest with you. You don't see it because 97 is just, they're two different well, types Kuhn's of people you're hearing huge, wrestling. And he's, like he kind of like Kirk has know, the illusion kinda, that he's moving faster because he's so long. He's pretty big. He's pretty. He's big, and I, I'm not saying just because he's big he's not fast, but like he kind of just lumbers, and he kind of like. Because <sighs> you have to realize like Kyle the way is not like a dude who's like fast in the sense that say like an Austin DeSanto or like Dayton Fix was That's fast. Not fast. It's That's more just like slick. That's more Dayton timing Fix than everything. Did... Dayton Fix is pretty fucking speedy. Um, no, I mean, well, like, the, his timing is impeccable, like, when he I does, mean, when one he does could argue, through. One could argue that speed in wrestling is timing. That's why John yeah, but there's Smith a difference about – Yeah, that's timing. I'm talking about, like, pure athleticism-wise. Gable blows it out of the water. Hmm. You know, I'll be honest. I don't think there's many people in the world that can match that. You know, you look Match at athletic. You look at athletic Gable. wrestlers, speed wise. You know, as I mean, relative. Obviously, you're not going to go out and compare Gable Stevens and RBY, who can move faster. It's all relative to the guys you're wrestling. Sajulayev, probably. Like if you scaled him up to 125. No, I mean compare Sajulayev tonight. Okay, relative would be comparing. So if you go relative strength, right? A relative strength of 200 would be comparing a guy weighing 200 pounds to other people that weigh 200 pounds. Pound for pound right. would be used to compare guys that a guy that weighs 100 pounds and a guy who weighs 200 pounds to each other. Yeah. That, that's the difference there, right? So you think no one at 125 kilos is matching Gable Stevenson's speed? No. Right. I mean, I mean, 100%. Like, and if you know, like, I was 100% against Gable before this. Like, I, I remember I once said this man would never win a national title. What the right. fuck were you on? Huh? Dude, what? He was an asshole. People started to hate him for that, right? And he, he still is. You're not going to deny that. But, like, the villain persona fits him more than anything. I don't even think it's a villain at this point. I think it's just he's so good and people can't stand it. Yeah. That's 100%. Physical dominance-wise, like, obviously, if you want to watch Spencer Lee, that's not – you know, let's be honest. He's not too fun of a wrestler to watch because he just turns people on top. Seeing a guy get He's manhandled. An wrestler to watch. He is an excellent wrestler to watch if you want it from a technical standpoint, right? Like, yeah. I obviously go watch his stuff. There's no way I'm wrapping around a 285 dude with a fucking gable bar and turning him like five times. But there's obviously things I can work on. Like, gable does stuff that you can break down very well. And the main difference between gable back in 2019 and gable now is his ability to chain wrestle. Gable might just prove me wrong on, like, something that I was talking about, like, before we started recording, saying that, like, um, pretty much our most, like, elite guys, like, the top of the top, they pick their shots, mm -hmm. right? People complain about, like, Dayton Fix and Nick Suriano and occasionally, like, Jaden Cox even, right? These guys that maybe shoot two, three times mm -hmm. a match ever, maybe even, like, only one or two. Yeah. But those are our top, top guys for a reason. Yeah. Because whenever – the more you shoot – the more you could possibly, you know, get defended and stuffed and scored on, 
and especially in freestyle, which obviously whenever we want to talk about our top guys, it has to be in freestyle just because that's who we send to the Olympics. Yeah. Gable might prove me wrong on that. I'm not going to lie. Just because he's so high percentage every single time he gets onto a leg. I was um, – that knows, Mike Mal breakdown yeah. that he um, did yeah. of his Big Ten But I think with that Harris. is, again, my main thing I want to get into. You look mm-hmm. at those – Remember, if you go up at the freshman year, Gabriel, if he shoots under a guy, that there were times he got stuffed. Obviously, it happens. He would just chill there. Now he he hits because he was in both knees on shots. Because you yep. so you, you just to realize these guys don't get scored on throughout their entire high throughout their high school career. You know that's yep. why a lot of them suck at bottom. These are an average yep. heavyweights going to D one level competing like that. Yeah, like people are coming at Kirk like if you all American as a freshman to heavyweight. That's insane, you know? That's, yeah. Getting off bottom, you know, you have to assume that would have been his downfall, if anything. He's good enough on his feet. He's good enough on top. And he, he's technically more sound than technically the second most sound heavyweight out there, in my opinion. Yeah. I'll be honest with that. But if my, my process behind this is if Gable can blank Nick Wazdowski, Two zero. Two matches to none in the Olympic trials. He is my pick to win gold. And I yeah, mean, I, if by blank, I mean tech. Oh. I mean tech, yeah. I mean, shit. I mean. If he does yeah, that, yeah, he's my pick to be Tom or Gino Petrosvili. His, I mean, his downfall will be an upper body move. Here, here's my biggest thing. Here's my biggest thing, just because um, it's a general trend in USA yep. wrestling. I agree with your scenario where if it's a two-match shutout, Andy texts him, but it also has to be takedowns because I just don't see – I don't know what Gable's it is. not a turn, I think just, dude. Yeah, exactly. But he and talks he, a lot about his transition to either double leg gut wrench or single leg leg lace, see which thing, obviously it's an excellent yeah. transition, and you should be able to score off mm-hmm. of your own transition. But there's just something about, like, the minds over, like, in other countries regarding parterre that they just have something figured out that we don't, right? And I think one of them is I saw – freestyle their entire lives. Yeah, but it, you know it's what? just something about – they turn different because a Russian yeah. gut-wrenching someone is way less of a fight than um, an American gut-wrenching someone. And I think it's because we try to, like – muscle it because i've said it before they're American also just wrestlers, much stronger than us like you know American you know how strong kind of you know how strong uh, bodybuilders is, right? powerlifters and wrestlers at the yeah. same time they're just wrestlers right yeah. like i've seen it sajulayev doesn't really touch a barbell very often like if you yeah. if you look at least at yes, training footage that's how you judge they it's mostly bands and occasionally kettlebells but you, what you have to realize is they don't show you everything they don't show you everything. They exactly. show you yeah. what they want to show you. Yeah, I'm also judging off of, like, Kerry Colot talking about, like, training experiences and stuff. Yeah. And, I mean, it's just fucking – I so I watched a Dan Bennis video on gut wrenches, which in terms of, like, a dude with, like, pretty good parterre offense for an American, Dan Dennis is a good example. Yeah. Um, and then I look at – Abdul Rashid Sajulayev, who obviously best gut wrench on the goddamn planet, right? Uh, and obviously, Lopez. I have also nope. had other really Leon excellent Lopez on freestyle that coaches. Oh, yeah. Leon Lopez. Okay. No. That, best that, that, freestyle yeah. gut wrench. Okay. I was about to say, like, you can look at freestyle gut wrenches all you want, but yeah. Sajulayev's gut wrench is nothing wrench, compared yeah, when you throw it to Lopez. the Greco. Yeah. No, but like, yeah. even most, I'm pretty sure most Greco Olympic medalists have a better gut wrench than Sajulayev. And that's just to be expected. Yeah, because they have to. That's the only turn. It's there. And what's that? The Robbie Smith, like, head pinch? Yeah. Oh, you've never seen the head pinch, dude? Oh, my God. No, got, no yeah, no, the gator roll? Yeah. Kind of like a gator. It was like he has a head locked up like this, and he puts his knee in the in the armpit and, like, pinches it. Oh, I, I yeah. love that turn. But you also have to realize, Robbie, when Robbie Smith was, like, in his prime, you, were, you probably weren't even wrestling yet. Like, 2014, um, 2015. How long have you been wrestling? Oh, fuck no, I wasn't wrestling. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, wait, I no, I just started. Yeah, like you weren't big into wrestling then. I remember one of the first yeah. matches I watched was um, Adam Kuhn versus uh, Robbie Smith at the Olympic trials, where uh, Robbie Smith um, hit him with the arm spin twice, actually. Beat him seven. I love that, bro, so yeah. much. 
he was so good. He's the thing that shows that technique can win you matches in Greco. And it's not solely based on size. Yeah. Who was the stronger, more athletic a- athlete on that day? Adam Goon. Adam. Who was the better wrestler on that day? Robbie Smith. You know? Robbie Smith. And that just goes to show that the technique Our spins are a fundamental technique. <laughs> that <laughs> that technique only gets you so far without strength and size. Lopez is by no means the most technical record wrestler out there. But he's one of the His greatest. Gut wrench is a thing of beauty. Yeah. But you, why is it a thing of beauty? Who has a more technical gut wrench? Sajulaev or Lopez? Sajulaev. Lopez, just has actually. Maybe, but like you have to realize look at what Lopez looks like. Yeah. Tell me it's not even a little bit easier to turn somebody when you're built like that. It's whenever you're turning someone else who weighs as much as you. So Abdul yeah, Rashid Sajulai. So this is why I talk about there's a freestyle and then there's a Greco way to go. Yeah. There's right? a difference. Because with freestyle, between... you also have to worry about like step overs. Yeah. And Dayton Fix uses his gut to get a leg in and then start doing other turns. Mm-hmm. So Sajulai steps in at the hip, right? And sometimes he'll cover the hip with his foot. And then that's what allows him to pop his hips in and under. If you watch how Sajulai gut wrenches, he actually doesn't even bridge half the time because he doesn't have to. That's like the more masterful way to gut wrench because whenever you do that, you pull your opponent into your hips. And this is why freestyle skills are valuable for folk style as well because just like whenever you're tilting, if you pull his hips into yours, you're in control. So yeah. Neon Lopez, becomes... because he's in a Greco rule set, if he steps in like that, he could risk a leg foul, right? So he just has to keep him tight to his chest and then he, he'll go one way, go the other, or he'll go trap arm and then he has to pop and bridge. So in terms of that pop and bridge and he doesn't even do that. Because, again, the they control. give you, like, the room so where, you know, when you're rolling over your back, you can roll over flat over your back when you're garbage somebody. Yeah, you can, but you're not going to get the turn as well. Yeah, no, obviously that being said, but if you ever go watch him, there's nobody in the world that hit, that's his size. The fact that Adam Kuhn is out here cutting from, like, 310, 315 – and is towered over by Mian Lopez, says something. Yeah. Like, it's at the end of the day, the man looks like he's not even trying in most of his matches. Cone or Lopez? Lopez. Lopez. Yeah. Like, he just chose from neutral. It's like, when you go on bottom, it's like, shit. I remember he took down Robbie Smith, snapped him to the, snapped his face through the earth with one hand. Spun behind and just got wrenched him. Like, you know? And it's that's, that, how, it's like, that's how good you should try to develop one technique. Just I mean, make that's it so the that only you technique. You're not even trying. Yeah, it's like that. But he didn't, it's like the physical dominance factor is what's kept him at the top for so long. Yeah. All right. So, and now all that, the way back. Yeah, no, <laughs> we, we went completely off topic. But even yeah. with Kirkfield, we, we're supposed to be talking about NCAA seedings right now. And now we're talking about freestyle. But where does Kirkfield fall in the seedings? Around like 12, I think? Yeah. What match could that set up in the round of 16? Let me know. <laughs> Mason Paris. Fuck. <laughs> Mason Paris doesn't have the best track record as five seed. You saw somebody get inside Mason Paris' head. Never seen that before. Yeah. That's what needs to be said. Dude, like, a lot of people just come on just coming at the man on Instagram and Twitter. I was like, what the fuck did you want him to do? Like, he didn't do anything wrong there. He was talking on Twitter. Okay, Gable does that all the time, too. Again, Mason Paris is not... Mason Paris, at least to my knowledge, isn't... He's not much of a talker anyway. He's not. Yeah, he was just building up the match that frankly, didn't really need much more build-up, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, no, obviously, I thought I had Gable winning 10-7. to 7. I thought Mason Bears getting a takedown was inevitable, as I said before, but this just goes to show that, like, damn. No, not he kind of, like, Mason Bears That kind of kills dunk. the hype of the match, to be honest, because now that's pretty definitive. I mean, Stencil. It's wrestling, and you never know, like what Paris is going to be able to do in a week. Is this is it this weekend nationals? Yeah. 
Because you have to think, who's making – after Gable talked that much, I don't see him losing. He knows he can take it to him. When it gets to the point that you're flexing on a guy mid-match, when have you seen anybody do that before? Maybe. I don't think I ever have. Never, no. <laughs> Let's be honest, no. And is it ever going to happen Gable. again? Probably not. Gable, Probably Gable's Gable. Gable's big on the theatrics. Gable's yeah. big on the theatrics. It's like... I've been saying before, if there's one guy that Gable cannot score bonus points on, it's Matt Stencil. And he's the only one that Gable hasn't wrestled yet out of the top guys in the country. Colton Schultz possibly, but Gable has proven to be able to exploit Colton Schultz's athleticism in his defense by just going outside low singles. Yeah. That's how you beat him, right? Yep. No, I wouldn't be surprised if Colton Schultz places that high. I don't like – I'll say right now, I don't like Gannon Gremmel being the four seed. I don't think anybody does except for him. <laughs> let's be let's be yeah. completely honest there. Ethan Laird, I don't like that, but that's gonna have to boot Jordan Woods higher. I think Jordan yeah. Woods, a guy who's getting extremely technically sound. I think I would put him over Ethan Laird, but you just because he's a fourth place All American, right? Yeah, right. Who are the actual returning All Americans, like the real All Americans? Gable Stevenson plays third. Jordan Wood plays fourth. Matt Stencil plays seventh, and Trent Holger plays eighth. Those are the only guys. But actually all American. You know, and Gable's the one seed, Stencil's the two seed as it stands. Jordan was the eight seed. Yep. That just brought six guys just moved into the mix. And Trent Hoger's around right. fifteen. Right. Which just makes it insanely stupid. Cause Trent Hoger's been so close to being Matt Stencil every time. If they match up in the round of sixteen, that's just terrible. It's just like, how would you even go about that? But I do want to talk about how would I see this weight class? Now, Gable won, right? That that just has to be said. Yeah. He's the one. He's yeah. proved it right now. 16-2 career record. Yep. I don't think there's a possibility that he ever loses again unless carefully it hits, hits a glow up, hits a Mason Paris glow up. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's very possible Penn State that those are the next next two national finals after this, if Gable stays. Yeah. Gable versus Kerfleet. Yeah. Yes. Two seed Mason Paris has to be said. Three seed I'll take yeah. Matt Stencil from Central Michigan. Four seed I'll take Tony Cassiope. Five seed I'll take Colton Schultz. Six seed, I'll take Greg Kerflit. Seven seed. Who's left from the Big Ten? Christian Lance is next, right? Yeah. Seven, seven seed, I would take Jordan Wood. Eight seed, I'll take Christian Lance. Nine seed, I think Hilger gets criteria over Orndorf. So I'll take yes. Hilger. Then Orndorf 10, Luffman 11. Yeah. Then Laird, 12, from Ryder. Yep. Yep. Gannon Grummel, 13. Carter Isley, 14. Bobby Heald from Army, 15. And um, yeah, that's really their all is to say there, really. Like, I don't think – I think Heald needs to be Brian Andrews, 15, then Heald, 16. Yeah. And then Zach Elam, May even drop to Zach Gillum has to go in the mix. Maybe I throw him in like 12, 13. Yeah. It's a whole that's a whole blood round freshman. Like, in you, he just gets thrown to the side there. Honestly, that's really what that is. Yeah. That's kind of insane to think about. Yeah. Overall, though, like, how would you even see this weight class in the first place? Like, I know they're all coming at flow, whoever's trying to. Talk about this, but like, there's no real correct way to seed this after one and two. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a mess. And that that that's just without being said, just because of the whole all in conference. Like, what do you want to say? Like that that's kind of thing. 
But that, but that being said, though, like I think that's that's really it. Like to be honest, I don't think there's anything else to talk Thanks about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any last words or? No, not really. All right. So uh, that being said, thank you guys for watching. This has been episode fifty-seven of Late Night Shots. Technically, we're gonna be filming this today, but it'll be dropping tomorrow. We're gonna be talking about Big Twelve a little bit and how they're fair in nationals. So that being said, thank you for watching Late Night Shots podcast, and we'll see you guys again next time. Peace.